Hello, I'm Dr. Brian Keith Hodges, Chair for the Department of Religious Studies here at Beulah Heights University, and I am blessed today to be with Dr. Alicia Plant and Dr. Monty Norwood. This segment of our time today is called the Town Hall, and it gives our students an opportunity to engage with us about the recent presidential election. There are a myriad of thoughts and feelings that surround the results and outcomes, some on the right side, some on the left, some straight down the middle. And in any case, we wanted to create a forum, an opportunity, if you will, for our students to pose questions, share comments and thoughts, and give us an opportunity to respond. I'd like to begin by inviting Dr. Plant and Dr. Noel Wood to give greetings, and then we'll dive right in. Before we do, I want to remind you, this is a live encounter, so please share it, host a watch party, then throughout the discourse of your week, share it again so that we can continue to get this kind of dialogue into the ears and on the eyes of people who would be best benefited and impacted by it. But also, I want to ask you to take the time to submit your questions. We have an on-site uh, in person who will in turn relay those questions to us and we will answer them as thoughtfully as you would like. If there is a question that you'd like to direct to any one of us specifically, simply say this question is for Dr. Plant or Dr. Norwood or Dr. Hodges. If you don't, we'll all three take a stab at it. So, Dr. Plant. Hello, everyone. So, I am having such a wonderful time today with my dear colleagues. I'm so excited to be with them. Um, this has been a fruit, the first part of our conversation has mm -hmm. already been fruitful, so I'm looking forward to part two. Awesome. Hey, I'm Monty Norwood. Privileged to be here with two great scholars. Glad that you're here. Let's get some great questions and some dialogue going. So, I'd like to begin by thanking you again for being connected with us. And in just a minute or two, Dr. Plant, you wake up Wednesday morning. What were your thoughts in relation to this presidential election? <clears throat> well, I, you know, it just wasn't too, it wasn't very surprising to me because I've, I'm accustomed to the antics <laughs> um, that, have been, that have been coming from the White House of recent. And so I, I, I wasn't uh, surprised um, at all. Uh, but I will, I will say the, the, the Wednesday morning, right after Tuesday, Tuesday night, that I was happy to know um, that I thought it was going to go way downhill when it came down to the votes um, in one direction. And it, it changed. But I wasn't surprised that there was already some issues with uh, complaints about voting fraud, voter fraud and all of that. I wasn't surprised at all. Dr. Norwood, you woke up Wednesday morning. <clears throat> And to your surprise, after uh, being a part of the electoral process in America as a voter and to lead people to vote through the incredible pulpit you had in Ohio and the pulpit you currently have in Atlanta, what did you think when it was inconclusive? So my feeling was different from yours because we talked that day and the different from Dr. Plant, I respect what you all said. I was surprised in a disappointed way that there had not been a tidal wave of <laughs> proactive response after all we've seen and endured for four years. Uh, at that point, over 200,000 COVID deaths, uh, 800,000 cases in America, just truth and competence. Uh, I could not believe that the results were not more definitive and clear, uh, but it was a slow unfolding. I could not bring myself to watch any election results. Didn't turn on the news that morning. Uh, heard, saw a little bit of the news and my news feed on my phone and uh, was disappointed it was not clear as to what was going to happen. I thought it should have been clear. I prayed for a definitive sign from the Lord. And the Lord works, of course, in mysterious ways God's wonders to perform. But uh, disappointed that it was not a clear, more definitive uh, result. I, um, I kind of rolled back my thinking to look at the consciousness of America. And while America has made incredible strides in a number of areas for which we should loud and celebrate, I think some more base issues are issues that concerned me, such as the colors of that map. And to think through four years of misogyny 
bigotry, racism. Through four years of that, we still had a country that was hotly divided. Mm -hmm. And it made me challenge what the status quo in America is, and that is we're making progress in race relations. I doggedly disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, I hotly disagree that we're making strides. Okay. I really feel like the last four years has been a revelation of this embrewing and staining, this tainting of our country, this uh, cancer called racism that's eating away at the very heart of our country. Mm -hmm. We got a chance to see it up close and personal. Mm -hmm. I believe this, Dr. Noah, Dr. Plant. I believe if we never agree on anything, we can agree on this. America did not make the progress we thought it made in terms of race Absolutely relationship. Not. It has it has not made it. <laughs> and so I want to invite you again. If you're watching us on this live, please send in your questions. We're ready to engage them. We're ready to chat with you and discuss with you. Um, now I have to tell you, in addition to having three scholars and three pragmatists. You also have three preachers. <laughs> so, so you need to hurry up and ask because we, <laughs> we already got a heart and a, a heart full and a head full <laughs> of things that we can discuss. I'll, I want to pitch another one while we're giving our students a chance to collect their thoughts and maybe pose a question. Dr. Plant, for the first time in the history of our republic, we have a female vice president mm -hmm. of color in the second highest office in our country. Mm -hmm. um, as an incredibly dynamic sister, uh, Dr. Plant is uh, not just an incredible instructor, uh, an incredible leader. She leads our doctor of ministry program. She also is the director of our virtual learning program here at Beulah Heights University. Uh, but Dr. Plant is also a preacher, a proclaimer of the gospel, and not just a preacher, a phenomenal preacher. So when you think about every dimension, mommy, academician, preacher, prophet, mm -hmm. what did Kamala Harris's appointment first and then ultimate election, what did that represent to you, being a woman of color? You know, I that question is uh, something I, I am continuing to um, mull over in my heart and in my mind because um, I don't really think it's um, hit me completely yet because there are so many dimensions to considering this um, this topic. I'm very excited, first of all, for the representation um, of having a, the woman in leadership. I think we have missed many opportunities, mm -hmm. however, Agreed. of engaging women at a um, a higher level for leadership in this country, and and but it represents the many facets um, and areas of our community, larger community in this country, and some parts of the world, where we do not take advantage of um, both the feminine and male energy that God has blessed us to have when it comes down to having um, conversations and having. Uh, discussions about leadership and participation in leadership. It's unfortunate that it took this long. There have certainly been capable women well before mm -hmm. um, Senator Harris, though I, I take nothing from her. And I, I've, I've mentioned earlier about identity politics, and I think they have their place. Um, but having the representative does not mean that we have made the necessary shifts to uh, toward what that having a woman in that place really means. So I'll, I will continue to look out for that because I often think as a woman um, who uh, has traveled some roads uh, where other people have not traveled in areas of leadership and much of my, my um, professional career has been marked by um, misogyny and um, misogynoir, a combination of being black and uh, uh, being oppressed as a, um, and fe as a female. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I will say is that it is very important that we don't get taken away with uh, the representation mm -hmm. before we really dig deep to look at is 
that indicative of the work we need, the progress we really need. Because we had that with Barack Obama. We had the Ooh, representation. But it only just exposed that we had not made the strides we thought we made with mm -hmm. racism. And I wonder what this will look like now that we have a woman who could very, very well be in a position to be president. I wonder what will happen. A really profound response, uh, Dr. Plant. Dr. Norwood and I sit mm -hmm. in different positions in that both of us are um, senior pastors of established congregation, he pastoring the church that his father planted, me pastoring a church that's been around 152 years. For me, for Dr. Norwood, we have both been instrumental in bringing African American Absolutely. females to the forefront of ministry. Uh, I'm, I'm almost certain, but correct me if I'm wrong, your executive pastor is a female. Yes, correct. The executive pastor, a wonderful woman that I had the privilege of meeting for the first time in our church's history. We had never, when I came to pastor the church in Marietta, they had never had a woman preacher, let alone one who was licensed and ordained. Mm -hmm. And since for the last 25 years, we've had a dozen or so mm -hmm. licensed and ordained. I was mentored in the faith by my mother and my aunt. I learned the foundations of the faith. So I've always had a huge, a hugely high valuation and veneration for female leaders, especially African American leaders. So I did not have to probe through so many variables in my affirmation and support of women. As a matter of fact, I did what people would call pastoral suicide. I told the deacons, we, we were going to have them, they were called to preach, and they were going to be held in the highest office of this church. Uh, and if should I retire or resign, then I would probably be recommending one. And to my surprise, all the deacons said, amen and all right. <laughs> so I, I've never had that. So when I saw Joe Biden pick Kamala Harris, it was different when I saw John McCain pick Sarah Palin. It was different when I saw Hillary Clinton run. Um, and part of my difference was I saw an individual that bridged every gap, that stood in the gap, made up every hedge, and would bring to the table something that was uh, keenly beneficial. I saw a person that wasn't merely a career politician. By virtue of her vocational track, Kamala Harris was not a career politician as much as she was an individual who was invested in making sure that the measure of the law was uh, Meet it, measure it out in a way that people would find equity and justice, etc. So I was very pleased. Uh, a half term, like Barack Obama, a half term senator, for he from Illinois, she from California. I was, I was, ecstatic. Now I, I, I was not particularly supportive of Kamala Harris's bid for president, but I was particularly ecstatic when Joe Biden picked her for the vice. President, although I probably would be dancing had he picked Keisha Lance Bottoms, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> <laughs> what were your thoughts about uh, Joe Biden picking a running mate that was female? And uh, I think Dr. Plant brings up a huge point that we're we fully not seeing the ramifications of this. I think it pushed through because a number of people, especially blue people, Democrats, we're tired of Donald Trump, so it wouldn't matter who he picked. Right. But I think that Kamala Harris adds a depth to that party. Youth, uh, vigor, vim, vitality, um, energy, motivation, <clears throat> um, representation. Well, what are your thoughts, Dr. Norwood? So I, I think it's uh, dues that have been paid that would come due. <laughs> he forecasted uh, Joe Biden that he would pick not only a woman, but a woman of color. And he kept his word. He also said that had he gotten the opportunity to fill the uh, Supreme Court seat of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, he would have picked also a woman of color. So that would have been exciting as well. I think that uh, African-American people, black folk, have been loyal to the Democratic Party. And that's what I mean about dues have been paid. And I don't think Kamala comes to us in a vacuum. There's a uh, our four mothers and four parents, many nameless from the motherland, Sojourner of Truth, uh, Harriet Tubman, Rosa sat so Ruby could walk, so Kamala could fly. Yeah. <laughs> Rosa Parks, Ruby Bridges, and now Kamala. So she's the fulfillment of a lot of pain, a lot of tears, uh, people sacrificed their life, their, their blood, sweat, and tears. And so 
I was excited that he made uh, that prediction, that he kept his word, and I think that she stands on all of our shoulders. She doesn't come to us in a vacuum out of nowhere. We paid some dues. Absolutely. And for people who have all kind of things to say negatively against the Democratic Party, we support them and we get nothing in return. I think she's exhibit A that we got something in return. Now, we have to hold her accountable. We have to hold them accountable. As I said in our last segment, we've got to be engaged, we've got to have expectation, and we've got to be consistent, and I will be. If you were to think back to when you were a student in school and what was happening in our country, how did that draw you in? Uh, I'm, I'm a student that started here in 97. Um, you at Morris Brown mm -hmm. in... The first time around, 93. 93, mm -hmm. and you went to ORU yep. in what year? I came out in 85. What year did you go, 84? I've Eight, been in 80, 81. 81. Yeah. So, when you think about where we were in 81, Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. In 93, Bill Clinton. In 97, Bill Clinton. When you think about where we were and what was happening in the world, what what drew us as students? I mean, this is a student segment. What drew you in as a student in 81? All sorts of things. My, my antenna were tuned to geopolitics, world events, as well as what was happening here locally. Um, you mentioned Reagan from my era. He stood on the, the uh, court court steps in Fulton, Mississippi, <laughs> which was a forecast, a signal that he was going to stand for a state's right. He was, it was going to be sort of retrogressive as it comes to African American people. And so that got my attention. You want to start your campaign on the court, heart, court yard steps in Fulton, Mississippi. That's a statement in and of itself. And sure enough, that eight years did a lot for others, but not so much for our community. Correct. Uh, the war on drugs ended up being a war on black people. Absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, that's not something I look back on with fondness, but I certainly was engaged. My antenna were up. And on the campus of Oral Roberts, I was introduced to the young Republicans <laughs> and what they were about. So I got a baptism in fire. It was called <laughs> the N-word my first day on the campus. Mm. Uh, wow. So I was baptized with fire. Well, I think, I think your dad was uh, saying, uh, come on back, because you come from a line of Morehouse grads. HBCUs. My father made the statement, you need the black experience, son, and if you don't go to Morehouse, I'm not paying for it. My goodness. <laughs> so, Divine, this is a true story. This was in the time that uh, there was not the internet, but that um, my father mailed my application to Morehouse. <laughs> and when Morehouse said that they didn't get the application, I considered that divine. Uh, <laughs> there so, so now there's four generations, or am I wrong? No, four. Four generations yeah. of the Norwood family that went. So you're 93, you're in Morris Brown, mm -hmm. an incredible HBCU mm -hmm. on the campus of the AU Center. You oh. get a chance to go to, to mingle with Morehouse and mm -hmm. Spelman and Clark Atlanta. And then you have uh, Morris Brown, who is of the same ilk and the same quality as those other institutions, the ITC, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, what's happening to you? What's going on in America that's impacting you, affecting you? You know, I grew up in my, in, growing up in my father's house, I mean, it just went my father's way. <laughs> and that, there was no question that's about it. That's the that. rest of our uh, <laughs> There was just no question about it. I mean, and so I, you know, we were a blue household. My father, then my mother and father, they're Democrats to their heart. You said the word Republican in my father's kitchen. He would look at you sideways. We just didn't play that. It was just, mm -hmm. and it was when I left my father's home that I, you know, began to hear other things and that got my, my caught my interest. I mean, though, we, I think it, in 93, we were all in this bubble, this Bill Clinton bubble. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we were very numb and we're not as aware as we are today mm -hmm. um, of uh, that we, we kind of just move forward and don't really think about what's really happening, why we vote a, cer a certain way, mm -hmm. uh, what policies are really being enact enacted on our behalf or not. And I think that's where most of a lot of Black America was at that time, because we even named Bill Clinton the first Black president. Correct. You know, yeah. And incorrect. Yeah, it, officially. <laughs> exactly. I just want to say that. And um, incorrect. And so I was, I was, I too was in that bubble, but it was being at Morris Brown College that I started questioning all of that then. Mm -hmm. And so I have a lot of my Morris Brown professors, my Egyptologist mm -hmm. <laughs> professors at Brown, to thank for saying, uh, "Come here." <laughs> 
Yeah. And it just really uh, waking me up to mm -hmm. so I could begin to think deeper um, mm -hmm. than I did. My first time voting, there was the race between George H. W. Bush and Walter Mondale, I think. No. Michael Dukakis. I can't remember. It was one of the two. So Ronald Reagan for eight years, then George Bush for four. George Bush, his first time was 89. Yep. Four, he was a one-term president. Right. So 89, and his running mate was, was it Walter Mondale? Dan Quayle. Dan Quayle. Dan that, that was his running mate. He was running against, um, um, I, I think it was either Walter Mondale or Michael Dukakis, Dukakis. I think. Michael Dukakis. Yeah. And I remember going into the voting booth mm -hmm. and voting for people that I didn't know because in my house yeah. it was blue. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I walked out of the voting booth saying to myself, I won't ever let that happen again. That if I vote for a person, it won't be because of a political affiliation. Now, keep in mind, I'm only 18 or 19. Mm -hmm. It won't be because of a political affiliation. If I vote for someone, it will be because I believe in them. So instantly, I became nonpartisan. Now, that was not a word you, you should say in my house, mm -hmm. uh, nonpartisan. I'm like, who's the best? Whoever the best person is, that's who I want to be in the office. Irrespective if they are red or blue, it's the first person I want in my house. But to answer the question I posed, when I was a college student here in 97, I think my biggest challenge that pulled my heart into the world was social issues like homelessness mm -hmm. and underemployment, unemployment, and those who were need-based, like hungry. That's, that's the thing that first got my attention. Because I was beginning to see that in America, we value a whole lot except life, right? I still wrestle with the fact of how simple universal health care can be and why there's such a struggle against it. I still wrestle with the fact of exporting jobs when we could employ people right here and pay them that money. I still wrestle with the fact that we have people who sleep under bridges. We have people who are barely making it, some of which who live at or below the poverty line, and America is still ignoring them. So my heart was pulled directly there. We've got buildings that are abandoned that with small investments can be retrofitted to house homeless people, and yet we're not. We've got urban blight, and we've got cities like Baltimore that's got rows and rows of buildings that if we put the money that we put in war in those buildings, we could house people, and nobody in America would go to sleep. We found out just in the survey that the, the unused agricultural land in Pennsylvania could feed every hungry person in America. And we're doing nothing with you that. You sound like a good politician right now. I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm trying not to. I feel like I'm and turning saying, into my dad. You're saying some of this on Veterans Day, when many of those that we're describing are veterans. Are yes. veterans. Given their all for this country. And, and then to even see yeah. the conditions that they had in some of their facilities. Black mold growing and overtaking. Oh their doctors not being compensated fairly, and you expect them to give competent and faithful health care. So those are the kind of issues that draw us from pulpits, mm -hmm. draw us from classrooms, back into the world, and say mm -hmm. no matter how good we have it. I remember when I was uh, in, at ITC, one of our professors, I think it was Marcia Snelligan Haney. I know her. She yes. said to us in missiology, mm -hmm. yeah. she said, uh, I'll give you a grade and double extra credit if you'll spend the night on the street with a homeless person. A number of our students did and came back in tears. Mm -hmm. We came back because we had no idea of the horrors. One student told of a PhD from UGA that was sleeping in the box wow. that he conversed with the whole night. Wow. And he said, I'm not crazy, I'm not on drugs, I'm not, I'm not stupid. He says, here's my issue. And he began to explain. I, I, was, I, mm -hmm. I was taken back, and I, I know this sounds a little naive, but I, I did not understand the, that the horrors of America lie in what we sometimes deem as lazy people. Mm -hmm. These people are lazy. Yeah. 
And the hypocrisy of it all is that these, some of these very same people are pro-lifers. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole. How other. dare you? <laughs> Uh, so the, the life that on, the only life that the the life that are in those boxes those lives yes where is the value where's, where's the valuation the, for those lives and what are we doing with the monies that we have that we continue to use mm -hmm. to fund this controlling narrative that comes out of the heart of our politics mm -hmm. when we could be mm -hmm. taking that money and grow imagine if if you would. Imagine how America would be perceived if not one family was hungry. I'm finding this out. I was uh, directly across the street from my church as a middle school, and one uh, generally they would ask me to come do a devotion for the kids, and I graciously go. And so uh, one teacher was talking about a student and how when she gets to school she's always got a bad attitude, etc. They're middle schoolers, and instinctively I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit or what I just said, ask that little girl when was the last time she ate. And the little girl said yesterday at lunch. And I said, that's why. My she God. comes to school hungry. My God. And when she comes to school hungry, you have misdiagnosed her and you said she's bad and she has an attitude. So I'm up preaching, I'm up doing a little devotion. And, and they said, um, how many people got their money for the Chick-fil-A biscuit? And half the room raised their hand. And she said, okay, everybody else, you go to class, you don't get Chick-fil-A. I said, hey, hey, hey. I said, how much are the Chick-fil-A biscuits? She said, $2. I said, how many of you want Chick-fil-A biscuits? Mm. Every hand raised up. I said, I'll pay the rest. I said, they're not going to, they're not going to watch their student, their, their friends eat Chick-fil-A and they Jesus. don't have to. I said, I'm going to pay for it. I will do it. She's like, do you know how much that is? I say, whatever it is, it's much cheaper than letting them walk out of here. Saying, I showed up early and this is what I get. My God. That's America. I want to join your church. <laughs> Me too. God, get the word of God and Chick-fil-A. I can tell you this, if the two of y'all join our church, I'll only be preaching once a month. <laughs> so, so when do y'all join it? <laughs> on first Sunday, second, third, we gonna and get the for you. But he, he, he talks about a perfect blend of orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I just love it because it is one of the reasons, but without these two speaking to each other and forming each other yes. and being at the base of who we are, there are so mm. many people who are just going to look at the church and walk right past. Them. Absolutely, yeah. They're not going to come in. They're Absolutely. not going. They're not going to let us come in either, if they don't see yeah. that. That's that, the merge of that. Yeah. That's so much of what the millennials talk about in terms of what they want to see mm -hmm. in the church. They want to see the church meet concrete needs. You know, past generations would have characterized what you described, Dr. Hodges, as Rosh and Bush's a social gospel. But how can I hear the good news if my stomach is growling right. so loud? And so I just appreciate the practicality, the incarnational ministry of what you yes. did. That's, that's the core message to take a theme that we talked about earlier. That's the core message of the gospel. That's mm -hmm. the good news that changes lives, transforms lives, leaves you better than when you were found. My I needed to find my footing as a pastor. I've been a pastor for 28 years. Uh, I've stood in the pulpit all of my adult life. And I needed to find a pathway, and I found that the easiest pathway was right across the street. How can I? So I have a, I have a policy at our church mm -hmm. that when the schools that we support, there are nine schools that we support, I said when they call whatever they ask for, they get. That's the policy, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So the principal across will call and say, we're doing this big event uh, with the kids, and we're doing hot dogs and hamburgers, and we need somebody to you know, to bring a grill and cook the hamburgers and hot dogs, and we, we may need a box or two of hot dogs and hamburgers. I said, okay. He's like, so what else do we need? I said, that's it. He said, so I don't have to remind you? I said, no, sir. So now when you, not when kids gotta eat. Yeah, you, a responsible individual, you don't have to remind them. And so we send people over there, and they do it. They, the, the uh, Honor Society, they didn't have enough money. This is a new one for me. They didn't have enough money for pins and t-shirts. So half the students weren't gonna get them. Mm -hmm. I said, I'll send you a check. So go ahead and order it. I'll send you a check. He's like, so we got to have the money before we order. I said, I'm, I'm standing at the front door. We're never going to allow. And it's not because Gathering of Champions is a big budget. We don't even have a big church. We don't have a big budget. But we've decided that foreign missions can't trump what I call neighborhood missions. Bet Trump was a bad word. Tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm glad you changed it. <laughs> That's why we fight every day. <laughs> <laughs> but 
glad you changed it. Yeah, that, that, we're, that we're engaged and we're connected and we're looking every day for ways and means to continue to impact the life. We don't, and we don't do any advertising. Like, you got to come to our church. If you come to our church, you want to come to our church because you want to. The goal is not to grow our membership. The goal is to honor God. The goal is to honor God. Are we doing the work to which God has called us? And invariably, when people remember the Gathering of Champions did it, they come to Gathering of Champions. Yeah. Well, I'm waiting for some students. I need y'all. Dr. Plant, if you have some, they'll, they'll send them. Send your questions. <laughs> We can talk about hair. We can talk about <laughs> attire. It doesn't have to be just politics. You know, we can, we're, this is roundtable discussion. Just joking. Well, well send I, your questions. I, I would share that, you know, um, I have the privilege of teaching systematic theology here. And I began each class with challenging the students to think theologically, mm -hmm. to think systematically through the headlines, the world events. Mm -hmm how you process them, because you will be facing the layered complexity of our society, the disparate opinions from within your congregation, your family, your community, and certainly within the body of Christ. And you need to think theologically about the core message of the gospel and what the scripture says about these issues. That's the classic definition of systematic theology. Mm -hmm. Any study that addresses what the whole Bible says about any question, any topic today, and we've never needed it more than we need it now, particularly sure. with the division and the schism in the body of Christ. A divided church can't help a divided nation. Mm -hmm. So we must start with the house of God. And so we start with the theologians that we're raising up and training here. So I challenge them, I push them. If any of them are looking, you need to have questions yeah, absolutely. <laughs> for us. Things that we grapple with. You talked about this in our last session. Mm -hmm. When you come to Beulah Heights University, we want to stretch you. We want to take you outside of the comfort zone so that you grapple, so that you struggle with the thoughts, with the issues of the day, so that you can come to conclusions for which you have convictions and you have the courage to stand up and let your voice be heard. And so, I think with yeah. we, when we have, uh, you know, tools like social media, it, it lets us know that the that the work is spread abroad now. It's mm -hmm. not just for those of us who are in the front of the line leading. Mm -hmm. It is for all of us. Mm -hmm. We're all a part of the conversation. We're all a part of the solutions. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to hear from everyone. There is no silly question. There is no bad question, I always like to say. Um, yeah. Even comments are appreciated. We need to get involved mm -hmm. and see that basically, I think um, tools like social media have really kind of flattened the line. And they're, they're, we're, we're seeing that everyone is kind of more equal with, with their thoughts and are able to come to the table and mm -hmm. engage and in situations that they typically would not have been able to do. Mm -hmm. So this program really invites us to use those types of um, tools to engage. So I want to respond to something you raised earlier, mm -hmm. Dr. Hodges, and you allowed Dr. Plant to respond. You asked her as a woman of color, black woman, how she saw Kamala's rise. And... I just want to take a quick look at the last two decades of presidential politics. Eight years of George Bush II brought us, I believe it was a precipitous for the election of Barack Obama. Eight years of Barack Obama, some people call it a white lash, brought us four years of Donald Trump. Four years of Donald Trump brought us now the Biden-Harris ticket. And it's interesting that Kamala's first remark was, I may be the first, but I won't be the last mm -hmm. woman. And we thought that Hillary would break that glass ceiling, it turns out that Kamala Harris was divinely selected, and I think that she is right. Mm -hmm. One of the things we consider systematic theology is, you know, what sin caused in the Garden of Eden, the division between the sexes. Mm -hmm. And my question to my students, are, are we going to lift up what sin caused or what God intended in terms of the equality of men and women? Mm -hmm. And so we address the issue of women in the home, women in the workplace, women in the church, in the body of Christ, and now women in federal government. I do believe that there's a divine purpose for women in general, women of color in particular. I think that, the, that such a time as this for their prophetic <laughs> voice and their leadership. I don't think that Kamala Harris, for all of her imperfections, the commentary that you might give about her has arrived at this place accidentally, but rather it is providential. I think that she will open a door for the rise of girls and women around the world. Absolutely. Her, her election is being applauded and so, I'm excited about that because it's a part of lifting up what God intends. And sometimes the wisdom and the competence that comes from women of color in general and African-American women in particular 
we can't help but be blessed and helped as a nation and as a people. As yeah, a whole. I, I think Dr. Norwood, you and Dr. P have really kept your fingers on the pulse of this mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Uh, having you here today has blessed me and our community. Uh, I know Divine has a question, and I know Rodrigo has a question. <laughs> and I'm going to give both of them an opportunity to ask the question. Let me take the first step, though, and I want to say this. I defend Kamala Harris's record as a state's attorney, uh, as a district attorney. I defend her record, and I want to say this. I know that it looks bad with some of her prosecutorial judgment, but she did her job. Uh, there are people who in 28 years will say, I don't like some of the decisions Hodge has made as a pastor, or I don't like some of the sermons he made or some of the directions he took the church, and they're well within their right to believe so. But the one thing you can't say is that I wasn't thoughtful, I wasn't faithful, I wasn't contemplative, I wasn't reflective, I wasn't passionate and I wasn't collaborative. You can't say that. I don't care who you are, you can say you don't like it, you can say it was a bad decision, you can say it was a failure or a flop, but you cannot say one of those five things. And so I stand in support, not necessarily agreement, but you have to make a decision. If she didn't make a decision, she's weak. If she did make a decision, she's aggressive. If she put people in jail, she's a tyrant. If she didn't, put people in jail, she's a jelly bag. There, there's no middle ground. And so we have to stand and say, she made the best decision. I mean, I, I, I seriously, and I don't know if you guys have done this, but I seriously tried to think of five pieces of legislation that Joe Biden authored in 40, in 40 years was in the Senate. I can't think of any. Except the one that's... <laughs> yeah, the crime bill. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Right outside of that. The one that almost cost him. The yeah. I, I, I will. I, I echo very much of what's been said here, and I, I'm so I'm so happy that you know that there's a woman of a VP. I, I hope I don't sound like I'm not uh, happy about it. But I think what she serves to remind us of mm -hmm. is our amnesia. Yes. Because women have have led. Women have been very very important. Yes. But we forgot. Yes. If there's anything we're guilty of, it's forgetting. We've forgotten the woman. Because America is patriarchal. So it's easy to forget mm -hmm. the contributions of women yes. as we lift up the leadership and contributions of men. And a healthy society is one that does. I never liked the, uh, analog the, um, uh, the metaphor behind every good man is a good woman. Not at all. Next it's to. Beside. And in many cases, in front. If it wasn't for gran our grandmothers, right. our mm -hmm. grandfather, Certainly. She, our grandmothers made our grandfathers look good. Our aunts made our uncles look good. Heck, Certainly. I remember the fact that it was my mama who told me who my daddy was. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, that that's an important piece that we forget. Okay, Divine, you have something. Yes. So Joe Biden um, tweeted on November 6th, we may be opponents, but we are not enemies. We are Americans. Do you feel that that's what Americans are uh, feeling today? What's going on? We're gonna start on that end and then media. come back. <laughs> I, that's a great question, Divine, and thank you for being here. Thank you for your role behind the scenes because without you, we wouldn't be here. You and Rodrigo, so thank you. Uh, I think it's a mixed bag. I think it's a layered, complex question. I think today, half of America roughly feel that we're still enemies, uh, <laughs> and half probably feel we just disagree politically. But I think that the tension is real. We've got work to do on both sides to address this. And we talked about this in our last session, but I believe we've got to hear each other. We've got to start with what we have in common and realize that oftentimes we want the same things. Uh, we've got to sit where the other sits, hear what the other is saying, because I think progress begins with recognizing what we have in common and realizing that we do it better when we do it together. But I would answer you that yes, <laughs> yes, we still have those who feel like we're enemies more than just disagreeing and that the tension is real. We've got work to do. There's a whole subculture of violence that's uh, boiling right now. Absolutely. Uh, it's, there's social media, the other channels of social media. I hear about things every day. Uh, that's comment that the current resident of the White House made uh, to the Proud Boys, a, a reputed racist gang. Uh, stand back and stand by. They are literally doing that. So the tension is real. I don't think by any stretch 
that the election of Biden, Harris, and even his inauguration on January 20th solves this or stops this. We've got work to do. That's why we've got to be engaged. We've got to have expectations. We've got to be consistent. We've got to work across every divide that we have. That's why even my own self, personally, our congregation, we're working toward reconciliation by talking to our white brothers and sisters. Dr. P. Mm. You know, I'm not so quick to sing Kumbaya. <laughs> um, we're not ready to I'm sing Kumbaya. I'm not singing yet. Kumbaya yeah, ever again. Right? Uh, I think there, in, in our conversations, as we intentionally engage, that we should leave space for lament mm, as good. well good. as That's the good. space to, to sing Kumbaya. Mm -hmm. I think we have to make space to do both. Mm -hmm. We good. cannot gloss over people's pain. It is very real. And one election, as Dr. Norwood has said, is not going to wipe everything away. And, and Trump, as I mentioned before earlier today, mm -hmm. just represents the stench of the ills. He is not in enough in himself. I mean, he's pretty, he's pretty good. He's done a pretty good job of inciting a lot of these things. But he just represents it. He is, a sim he is the sign of the sickness. Mm -hmm. He's a symptom of the That's real true. ill, the real sickness. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some people who would say that we have Dr. That we have Donald Trump to thank, because there there, there there's a quick gloss over um, in some uh, parties and some uh, directions and some liberals who want to quickly say let's let's all just you know we we have to unify. Mm -hmm. But with the Donald Trump, you have you know who you're exactly what you're dealing with, mm -hmm. and so you there's no mistaking that's true that you have some real deep ills and problems that's that good. you need to correct. So in the, in a twisted kind of way, I guess, that we could say, you know what, I'm glad that I'm able to see who Donald Trump is. Because seeing this really Absolutely. tells me how very deep the problems are True. in this country. That's we wouldn't good. see that if we kept on with a Bill Clinton playing his saxophone. That's good. Dr. Norwood and I have had this conversation on and off camera, and I've always maintained that Donald Trump was the world's greatest blessing to America. Mm. Because we got to a place where we thought we were there, mm -hmm. and we weren't. And Absolutely. by virtue of Donald Trump getting elected, if we didn't have any other Republican, uh, career politician, Republican to get elected, we would have stayed in the delusion. Yeah. It is, America has a, what I call sweet poison, and mm. that's this, this racism. It's innocuous, it's behind the scenes, you can't, Donald Trump getting elected showed us, Donald Trump having a bid for the White House for a second term after things were blatant, <sighs> conspicuous, yeah. could not be hidden and would not be altered or corrected mm -hmm. is a reminder of where America is. Yep. I want to answer that question that you put forth to Vine. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm tired of rhetoric. I'm tired of speeches. I want to see work. I want to see people in the trenches. I want to see presidents and mm -hmm. vice presidents, secretary of states, cabinet members, secretaries in general in different departments. I want to see them in the trenches. I want to see them out from behind their offices and their desks. I want to see them. I want to see senators and congressmen meeting with their constituents mm -hmm. on a continuous and regular basis. I want to see them in every space that gave them a vote. I want to see them there, and I want to hear them mm -hmm. respond to people who ask them the hard questions. I want to see them sit in front of Dr. Alicia Plant and Monty Norwood, and I want Dr. Alicia Plant and Monty Norwood to pull back the door of the furnace of their discontent and let them have it, and I want to see them answer. I want a camera in their face. I want it on social media, and I want to see them respond. Mm -hmm. I want to see them respond to a person who say, I pastor a group of African Americans who have gone through these issues. Now, I want to put these issues in front of you, and I want to know, what have you done? Mm -hmm. You get elected for six years. What have you done in six years that address any of these issues? That's what I want to see. I don't want to hear any more rhetoric. I don't want to hear any more speeches. I don't want any more, let's join hands. Mm -hmm. I said to a group of pastors who said, We'd like to get together. I said, if, this, if we're only getting together in February, count me out. Now, if we can get together 12 months of the year, count me in. But I'm tired of us just meeting in February, have worship services. I go preach at your church. I become the person that's the, the civil rights, uh, black history, black awareness speaker mm -hmm. at a school. And then that's it and nothing else. That's what I want. That's what I want. Okay, Rodrigo. That gave me chills. You have a question. Powerful. I do. Um, Actually, many people still hesitate in celebrating the, the democratic victory because 
because of the history in the European and because of the history of previous democratic governments that in the European Union didn't do much for the economy or for immigration or for minorities. Mm. Um, and also, um, in previous democratic governments, they were seen as enthusiastic in the beginning, but then they turn out to not mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. many things. Yes, they do not do everything they promise. Mm -hmm. So that's that's. May I? Okay. Yeah, Doctor. Uh, um, in twenty twenty four, they won't have that opportunity again. Oh no. Because twenty percent of black men voted for Donald Trump. There is a large consensus, a growing consensus of black Americans that are absolutely tired yes. of voting blue and will do not feel obligated to do it anymore. Absolutely. So if we want to continue forward and they want to be seen as a progressive party, they will have to stand up and be and be held accountable for what they promised in their campaign speeches. I don't, I'm with Dr. Hodges. I don't want any more of the rhetoric. I want to actually see, because in 2024, you may just very well lose mine. Absolutely. It has to change. Period. And I think there, there's a growing community of black Americans who have said, uh-uh. It, it started happening with Barack Obama. Yes. Where there were people voting independently. You had people voting for Jill Stein. You had people voting for Porgy and Bess. In 2024, mm -hmm. if there has not been some changes in this, in this term, in this presidential term, um, you will. It won't be the turnout that you saw from this year. That's a, that's a prediction I'm willing to it's make. It's going to give rise to that silent party, that party that looks insignificant, that looks minuscule, that looks microscopic. Mm. That party is going to experience the kind of rise that gets them in the seat and stay. If memory is, serves me correctly, and I may be wrong, I think to date we've only had one president out of 46 that was an independent. One. So that day is coming back very quickly that we will have to ask the question, what did you do with the time you have? In Judges chapter 3, verse 31, it says this, After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, mm -hmm. who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. Before him is Ehud, who gets verses. After him is Deborah, who gets chapters. Shamgar gets one little verse. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how long it is. It's really just one long sentence. No matter how long it is, you got to do something with your verse. You got to do something with your shot. You got to do something with the opportunity given to you. Right. And in in, two, in 2014, like Dr. P says, we are not going to sit around. I, I know. I know. For me, Dr. Plan has voiced her uh, her concern. I am not going to give you my support. I don't care what color you are. If you did nothing in four years, we're finding somebody else. That's it. So. Um, when you said not miss my shot, I thought about Alexander Hamilton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a song from the play, <laughs> Not Gonna Miss My right, Shot. Right, right, right. So Rodrigo is a brilliant guy. He's from Brazil. He's got his own Trump down there, Bolsonaro. Uh, <laughs> right. He's a brilliant guy. I've had him as a student. He's also a professor in his own country, uh, not just a cinematographer. So I appreciate the question. My take is slightly different. I don't disagree with my colleagues, but... Uh, it reminds me of a vociferous comment from one of our members in one of our Bible studies addressing this, where she said, what have we gotten for our support of the Democratic Party? And so my analogy for her was the church in the world today. Going back to the last conversation, I don't disagree. Matter of fact, I actually agree with Dr. Hodges in terms of the hypocrisy, the idolatry, and the apostasy of the church, yet there's a remnant. I believe that because of the church in the world, because of the church being salt and light, things are not as bad or as worse as they could be. And so I think likewise, when it comes down to my vote, and I think about, I've been confronted, uh, Dr. Plant, with the statistic of why so many black men, that's a significant percentage who voted for Trump. I don't know what's wrong with them. <laughs> I don't know why they voted for him. <laughs> but before the Republican Party conservatives get my vote, who are gonna do me harm, uh, I'm going to vote for those, sometimes it's classified as the lesser of two evils, but I'm gonna vote for those who have the best record in terms of what they have done for good, for right. And so sometimes that's not, that does not mean that they have done all that they could do, all that they should do, but when it comes down to determining my vote, a, a vote for Trump was never on the table for Ever. me. Yeah, not for uh, me. Ever. And so that would never be a choice that I would consider. Now again, the Biden-Harris ticket may fall short, they may not do what I expect, but I don't, I don't expect things to be worse. Yeah, but I think <laughs> yeah, there's something to be said of that energy of, 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 of 
putting their back up against the wall. Listen, yes. you know what? We'd yes. rather vote this way. Yes. They continue that's to good. vote that way. That's well, you good. just you're taking our votes that for granted. Yes, it's real. So we we we're willing to risk it. Yes. We'll risk it all. You're risking it all when you voted that way. Yeah. <laughs> I think you know I, I said this the last time. I, I I was telling Dr. Norwood uh, a number of years ago. I uh, was watching Texas Hold'em poker, and I'm like, shucks, I need to learn this game. And so I learned Texas Hold'em poker, and it's such such an interesting game because in Texas Hold'em poker, the dealer deals everybody two cards. And then you have five community cards, and you need to make the best five-card hand with your two cards plus the cards that are present. Poker is a game based on a ten-hand ranking. And so I learned that uh, you know you start with a small blind, a big blind. Everybody wants to get in, put chips in, and then you get what they call the flop, three community cards. Then you get card on the turn, fourth card, and then the last card is a card on the river. If you believe you have the best five-card hands, you shove all your chips in the middle and you say, I'm all in. That's mm -hmm. what I'm expecting. I'm expecting our president-elect and our vice president-elect to shove all their chips in the middle mm -hmm. and say, I'm all in. Right. And that means if I lose big, and I have. I was playing, <laughs> I was playing in a tournament for gift cards. I was playing for gift cards. And I was getting ready to win this like huge gift card. And I had the best hand. The only problem was the guy who beat me had the same suit, the same two cards, his were just higher. And I want to say to them, I don't care if you get beat. I want to know that all your chips are in the middle. Mm -hmm. You said, I'm going after it. I'm not worrying about political status. I'm not worried about political uh, continuance. We want to make sure that when we go to bed, we left all the energy on the table, all of the drive we had, we're exhausted, mm -hmm. there's nothing left, then we can say that. And if I could just say, that's why Hillary Clinton lost. Hillary Clinton lost because all her chips weren't in the middle. She was riding on the fact that she had been in the White House eight years with her husband, mm -hmm. and that she had been a senator, and that she had been the Secretary of State. And she didn't have to put her chips in the middle. That's the difference between her and Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris has to put all her chips in the middle. She has to. She doesn't have a political pedigree like a Hillary Clinton. And now she realized it's all in or it's nothing. And the black community is sending, uh, I'm just clear speaking, message. it's a clear, clear. listen, you're not, you don't take it for granted yes. anymore, you're not going to automatically get it. Yeah, yes. we showed up for you, but that's probably your last time yes. of getting that many people to the polls for you if we don't see some actual change. Because there is that, that, that those who are on the, in the margins, that some may have voted for Trump, some may vote, have voted for Kanye West, <laughs> those people are getting 60, louder 000. and louder and, yeah, yeah, and bigger and bigger. And, and, and I, what Dr. Hodges is, is saying is right. Mental health is a real issue. It's a real <laughs> issue. Mental health is a real issue. But you can't do what Hillary Clinton did every, anymore. No. You can't, they, they can't do it anymore. Democratic no. Party is not no. the presumptive so party of the black community. So I confirm what Dr. Plant is saying from a different, slightly different perspective. This time we had, um, you know, the past four years and the record of the past four years and the wreckage of the past four years to inspire and engage mm -hmm. and ignite the electorate to go out and vote differently. So we won't have that in four years, but we will have the record of what the Biden-Harris team has done or not done to motivate or not motivate, to engage or not engage. So I, I, I affirm what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Most people no divine Zumbi here, BHU, most of them don't know, especially those who have not had a long relationship with her, won't know the divine is from Kinshasa, Congo. Uh, I know when she told me, she and her sister, her sister is one of my favorite people in the world, Great Sandy. Woman. Great lady. Both of them. They, they said, we're from Congo. I'm like, no, you're not. You're from, <laughs> you're from a little city in the Midwest. They sound like valley girls. <laughs> I think she has one more question for you. You got a question? Oh, I was getting ready to say. Uh, the, you've, you've experienced political corruption mm. in the worst way in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm. And uh, after your question, I'd be interested in us taking a stab at that one. Okay. Well, Rico's experienced some things, too. <laughs> and yes, in the worst way. So, um, Stacey Abrams says, um, I learned long ago that winning doesn't always mean you get the prize. Sometimes you get progress, and that counts. What do you think? Stacey Abrams makes an incredible, um, very valuable point. But I think one of the challenges is that we can't just win. We can't just make progress. 
We got to win and make progress. They can't be separate. We got to go home with the prize. Imagine had Stacey Abrams won the governorship in Georgia. Imagine what would have happened. Exactly. It would have changed the dynamics, right? If we just go back, uh, give me, what, 30 years? No, longer than 30, 40 years? When Maynard Jackson gets elected mm -hmm. to the mayoral office of, of Atlanta, the door opened from the time he got elected to the present day. We've never, we've always had a black mayor in office. I think the tide changes when we do more than make progress. We gotta get the prize. I'll give you one example. My dad was a golfer and you couldn't get me to golf. I saw Tiger Woods, who's about my same age. I've been golfing for 25 years, right? Somebody's gotta not just get in the door, somebody's gotta win the prize. And when Tiger started winning the prizes, right? There, there were more black golfers, check the stats out. There were more black people, especially males, who entered into golf because of Tiger than any other person. And we had plenty of black golfers prior to that. So we need not just progress, we need someone to get the prize. We need you to get that door. Either of the two of you. So Stacey Abrams is one of my sheroes, one of our heroes. Uh, she is arguably a uh, principal reason that Georgia is blue. Yes. When she was cheated out of the governorship because her opponent was the Secretary of State, uh, and it, it's the equivalency of the fox watching the hen house. He literally put people off the voting rolls and corrupted the process so much that she barely lost. Uh, instead of getting bitter, she got better. She formed an organization mm -hmm. that registered some 800,000 voters. You tell me that didn't make a difference, then I don't know who you're talking to. So I think that she herself is an example of progress. Uh, even if we don't get the win, we can improve, we can make progress. She made progress, and now we have the opportunity, going back to the first session, to change the whole tenor of the federal government by electing two Democratic U.S. Senators. This is a very unique opportunity to have both seats up at the same time, both seats in a runoff. On my birthday, January 5th, I only want one thing. I just thought I would throw that out there. We need to take our souls to the polls again. We've got to make a difference, take it home. And I think that uh, as, a, as a woman, uh, her reality is very different. And, and she, is, she can't see it, but so far, um, above all of the um, intersectional oppression. Uh, but she has several uh, bouts of it that she has to wade through. Mm -hmm. So I think it, there could be some piece of that that just really just sits with her every night that, you know, there are a lot of glass ceilings when you're black, when mm -hmm. you're a woman, um, when you're openly lesbian, um, when you're a certain a physical size. Uh, that it's all intersect sex, sectionals for her, and um, that's maybe what she's just sitting with every day, the reality that it's tough. And if you get some progress, hey, you go, girl. I want to thank Dr. Plant and Dr. Norwood. I promise you, this was not work for us. This was an absolute <laughs> fun. It was. Yeah, we had joy. an absolute blast. Enjoy. We get a chance to work together in religious studies here at Beulah University, for which I'm immeasurably thankful to God for them. They bring to our institution incredible experiences, incredible academic credentials, but they also bring powerful networks. And uh, I believe that our institution is better today because of them. Our president has remarked uh, in moments gone past that this is the best team we've ever had. I echo those sentiments, mm -hmm. um, having Dr. Plant and Dr. Norwood, um, I encourage you to think about this. This is the beginning. Um, I'm thinking already in, and thinking way in advance that when we do our town halls, we're gonna do them in the evenings and we're gonna advertise them in enough time so that we can have you. And maybe from seven to eight or eight to nine, I'll be able to lasso these two together and we come back and we do this again. One thing I wanna conclude with is this. We are not letting up. We're going in deeper. If there's an issue happening in our country, you best believe the three of us are going to lend commentary to it. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next time. Remember to share this live, host a watch party, and share this content as often as you can. Thank you so very much. Look forward to next time. Take good care. Shalom, shalom. Mm -hmm.